Hello, everyone. I'm David Highfill, a member of the board of the Spencertown Academy Arts Center, and I want to extend a hearty welcome to our annual Festival of Books. We're virtual this year, as you know, and not in the tent behind our historic 1847 building, but we have a robust program again this year, and I want to thank you for joining us, especially on this stunning holiday afternoon. We're extremely fortunate today to have Joyce Carol Oates with us. She's here to talk about her new novel, Night, Sleep, Death, The Stars. Ms. Oates needs little introduction to many of you I know. She is one of this nation's most prolific and prominent writers and the recipient of numerous prestigious awards. The National Medal of Humanities, the National Book Critics Circle Ivan Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award, the National Book Award, the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence, and many others. She's written dozens of indelible novels, including the national bestsellers, We Were the Mulvaney's, Blonde, and The Falls. And she is a professor at Princeton University. Daphne Calate is joining her in conversation this afternoon. She's the author of the novels Russian Winter, Sight Reading, and Blue Hours, and the collection of stories Calamity and other stories. She lives in Somerville, Massachusetts, and teaches at Princeton University's program in creative writing. We'll have a Q&A period following their discussion. Feel free to submit your questions at any time by way of the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen. It's in the information bar at the bottom of your screen. A quick note on uh, future programmings, um, programming of the Festival of Books if you're interested. Robert Kolker, who's the author of Hidden Road, Hidden Valley Road, rather, the number one New York Times bestseller about schizophrenia in one American family. He's coming this Wednesday, September 9th at 7.30. And two more next weekend, Richard Gere, the author of, of a book about the New Yorker cartoonists and their work, will be here on Saturday, September 12th at 4.30. And Ed Ward, the author of The History of Rock and Roll, will be here on Sunday, September 13th at 4.30 p.m. All of the programs are free, but you need to register online the day before the event, if you can. Also of note is our online specialty bookstore, which supports the Academy and the Festival of Books. We'd love for you to visit it if you can. 99% of the proceeds from that sale, from sales there and donations, go to our programming and annual budget. So these events and funds they raise are crucial to our survival. Please visit us on the web at spencertownacademy.org for more about us and our programs. About purchasing Ms. Oates' novel, consider supporting your local independent bookstore if you would. Here, the Chatham Bookstore is offering a 10% discount to customers who mention the Festival of Books, and they will ship the book to you, obviously. And a last note about today's session, if there's a technological glitch today, bear with us. We're in very good hands, but stuff happens. So if something happens, we're working on it and we'll fix it as soon as we can. Again, please join me in welcoming Joyce and Daphne. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Joyce, for being here. And thanks to everyone for joining us. I only wish we were sitting together in the gorgeous sunshine. Yes. I'm excited so much to hear from Joyce about this beautiful novel, Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars. I wanna show you how gorgeous it is. Um, I'm gonna ask Joyce some questions about it, but first I think we're gonna hear an excerpt that will give you a sense of the uh, inciting incident that sets this whole novel in motion. Joyce, will you read to us? Thank you, Daphne. I'm just so sorry that we're not together because it is beautiful. No. And I've heard such wonderful, wonderful things about Spencertown. Well, my novel is called Night Sleep, Death to Stars, and that's a line that's taken from a poem by Walt Whitman. So I might, be, I might read the poem first. Yes. The poem is called A Clear Midnight. It's a most unusual Walt Whitman poem, if you know Whitman's poetry. He has this very robust, sort of uh, extremely energetic and extroverted long lines that are very declamatory. But this poem is very short, and it's a, a lyric poem called A Clear Midnight. This is thy hour, O soul, 
thy free flight into the wordless, away from books, away from art, the day erased, the lesson done, thee fully forth emerging, silent gazing, pondering the themes thou lovest best, night, sleep, death, and the stars. The novel is, consists of a number of chapters, some of them quite short, and the prologue is fairly short. The prologue is an, an episode that sets everything in motion. So I feel that our lives are very accidental and contingent and things happen to us in a moment and the consequences reverberate and ripple through years of our lives and other people's lives as well. So I tend to begin my novels with that moment where something's irrevocable and yet at the time, nobody would have known that. So this is October 18th, 2010. Why? Because he'd seen something he had reason to believe was wrong and it was within his power or at any rate, it was his moral obligation to rectify it or to make that effort. Where? Returning home on the Kennecock Expressway at approximately 3.15 of that day, just beyond the grimy and graffiti defaced overpass at the boulevard where in the early 1970s, a 10 foot chain link fence had been erected when high school age youths rolled heavy rocks down upon motorists bound for the northern suburbs, causing the death of one motorist and the injury of others and considerable damage to their vehicles. From where? A luncheon meeting of the trustees of the Hammond Township Public Library at the Downtown Center Library, which John Earl McLaren, at that time mayor of Hammond, New York, had helped to rebuild in the mid 1990s. Since then, John Earl Whitey had not missed a meeting of the trustees in 15 years. Driving his vehicle, a new model Toyota Highlander, in the right lane of the three lane highway, at a speed neither above nor below 55 miles per hour. This caution in the light of his having consumed a single glass of white wine at the luncheon, though John Earl did not seriously believe he was driving under influence or that his driving perceived by any neutral observer could be so interpreted. Seeing then just before the exit at Meridian Parkway, which would have had him safely home in the house on Old Farm Road, in which he'd lived so happily with his dear wife for most of his adult life within 20 minutes. A Hammond police cruiser parked at the side of the road with its red light flashing and another vehicle parked close by. Two uniformed police officers pulling a young, male, dark-skinned individual from his car shouting into his face and slamming him repeatedly against the hood of the car. Slowing his vehicle to get a better look and shocked at what he seemed to be seeing, now braking, daring to stop just beyond the police cruiser, Darren Earl climbed out of his vehicle to approach the officers who were continuing their manhandling of the dark-skinned young man, though it was clear to John Earl at least that the young man was not resisting them unless you could call trying to shield his face and head from their blows resisting. Boldly calling out, stop officers, what are you doing? Brazen seeming fearless, summing something of his old mayoral authority in this new century, in this uncharted place. Scrubby inner city Hammond in which a stricter and harsher police presence prevailed, little known even to white citizens as knowledgeable as John Earl McLaren. And there followed then an excited exchange which John Earl would not recall afterward, as he would but vaguely recall that the dark-skinned man was of slender build, very frightened, not an African-American, but seemingly a young Indian in a suit, white shirt, torn and blood splattered, wire-rimmed glasses knocked from his face. Both police officers shouted at John Earl, get back into your car and get out of here, mister and John Earl dared to continue to advance. You're beating a defenseless man, what's he done? 
fired with adrenaline, heedless, insisting he would not leave. I want to know what this man has done. I'm going to report you for excessive force. Forgetting that he was 67 years old and had not been mayor of Hammond for a quarter century. Forgetting that he was at least 20 pounds overweight, easily winded, and taking a powerful medication for high blood pressure. In his vanity, assuming that since Whitey McLaren had been a popular moderate Republican mayor with a skill for political compromise, that he'd been a civic-minded citizen, a well-to-do local businessman, a poker-playing friend of the late Hammond police chief, and longtime contributor to, to, to the Police Benevolent Association, who believed and had said so often that police officers have a difficult and dangerous job and needed public support, not criticism. The officers might recognize him and relent and apologize, but that did not happen. So that's the opening of the novel, and the, the entire novel really follows from that, that event, that episode. Thank you so much. Yes. And I want to return in a minute to the Walt Whitman poem, which is so beautiful. But first, um, from what you just read, uh, you know, this is, of course, so timely when I think that this, this book came out in June. This has been this summer of racial reckoning and such a broader awareness of pr police brutality. Um, what's interesting is this, this book feels prescient, yet you said it in the years 2010 through January 2012. I'm wondering about when you began the book and also about your decision to set it a decade ago. Well, that's a very good question. I've been writing for much of my adult, <laughs> adult life. I have actually been writing about situations in American uh, urban urban centers. I lived in Detroit for a while, for quite a while, and Detroit has sort of permeated my consciousness. I was in the I was in the city of Detroit at the time of, of the Detroit riot, quote unquote, um, the civil what we call c civic disturbance. And I've always been so interested in um, the racial conflict of the kind, particularly that's not acknowledged. So I have written a good deal about police misconduct and police brutality, but this is the first time really that I wanted to investigate how white suburban Americans who are actually quite well to do, who have been shielded from the knowledge of the, the police brutality, um, basically just shielded from much of the reality of, Ameri of America. I wanted to show how they can get drawn into that and how oblivious they were before this. Now, Whitey McLaren, who's um, the character I was just reading about in the novel, he had been a political figure, a moderate Republican at that time, which means something different than from, maybe there are no moderate Republicans now, but there were moderate Republicans. And, and Whitey was a very decent man and a very good man with a, a, who gives money to, to uh, charitable causes and is concerned with, with uh, social justice. Anyway, that he would be drawn into this by stop, stopping at the side of the road because he sees two police officers beating a defenseless man. He just thinks as a white man that he can just stop, you know, and, and shout at them and make them uh, behave better. And of course, it's not going to be that way at all. They turn on him and consequently the whole novel follows from that. He's, um, they taser him and he collapses and, and so forth. So I think for many years or decades, well-to-do white people in the suburbs have been quite oblivious and immune to what's going on in the inner cities. Yes, um, there's a wonderful line, if I can find it, that his wife says later on, about her domestic life, where she says um, domestic life had blinded her to the real sorrows of the world. Happiness had blinded her. Yes, yes. And there's a scene in the novel where Jesslyn actually goes into the inner city and she goes to a meeting at a, in a church about um, really for, it's mostly for black people who have been victimized by the police and, and for their families. 
and she stands at the back of the church and she's one of the very few white people in the room and she just feels so shocked and overwhelmed that she hears all this, these years and years, all these instances of police brutality and she, she just didn't seem to know anything about that. It was possible to live in the city of Detroit as my husband and I did and read the newspaper and see the news and, and not really know what was going on because that the news of black people being victimized and black on black crime also basically just kept out of the news. I wanted to return to the Whitman poem that you read because first of all, it is so beautiful and I actually, I didn't know it. Um, and it seems to me to encompass so much of this book, the, the mystery and, and the beauty in its themes. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about uh, this poem for you and also its centrality to the book. Well, it's my, it is my favorite Walt Whitman poem. I've been, I've been reading and teaching Walt Whitman for a long time. And this poem comes along as a real shock because it's so antithetical to the usual. Walt Whitman. It's almost like a poem that Emily Dickinson might have written, and she's so opposite to him. But the, 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 though the novel is a political novel in a way, and it's about social justice and injustice, it's really, really a novel about, about a, widow, a widow's experience. And it's, it's sort of like a very personal, almost memoirous novel that I've, I've hidden inside a larger novel with a lot of other people. But rather than writing about just about the widow, I wanted to write about the effect on a complete a family, like all the children um, grieving for the lost father as well as the widow. So the novel try, is trying to do a number of things. But I think many of our personal and very private experiences do touch upon the political and the political touches upon the private also. Yes, and that's what I absolutely love about this book is that um, you're you're dealing with really important political themes, but it's um, an an intimate book, and we dive so deeply within each of these characters. Uh, at the same time, it's a page turner because we are so wrapped up in each person's story, and then when we leap to somebody else, you know, we're with them, but at the same time, we want to know what happened to the the other sibling. <laughs> so we have to keep yeah. returning and wait a minute, what, what's going to happen to her storyline? Well, thank so, you. Because I, I did like the characters very much. And in a way, one of my favorite characters was Lorraine, the high school yes. principal, because yes. she was so awful, so yes. absolutely without conscience. <laughs> I was cringing to watch her behavior. I know. And I was laughing at the same time because it was so awful. But you do something amazing, which is we start and I have to say I was actually conscious of it because I was watching her and I'm thinking this is terrible she's by the way I want to say she's described as tough and sexless as a turnip which is <laughs> one of my favorite phrases I've ever seen very tough yeah <laughs> so, but she uh we're watching her and and I was I was thinking this is so awful I I can't bear it. And yet I started to realize I was feeling compassion for her because she was suffering so badly. And then I thought, how is she going to get out of this? And I was thinking, how is Joyce going to get her out of this? And I actually wonder, as you were writing, how did you find yourself? Was there a point where you realized, how am I going to do a kind of acrobatic feat here? Well, I usually know how everything's gonna turn out before I start writing. But the funny thing is, I wrote this, this novel's written before the Trump era. It's not, in, not informed in any way by the Trump phenomenon. So the fact that Lorraine is a high school principal, she's a person with authority and responsibility. The fact that she is so sensitive to any slight, and she has this whole list of enemies in her high school. She has people who are her supporters, and her favorite, she always has a favorite or two, but they keep moving around. It's so like the Trump administration where Trump has these people he hates and he sends out these murderous tweets. Well, Lorraine is almost like that. She has meetings of the high school. 
she's the, the, the principal, and she's so aware of who votes with her and who votes against her, and they become her enemies, and she does awful things to them. She writes uh, negative recommendations for them. She ruins their careers. She does the same thing with the students. She can get into their computer, their files in the, in the office, and she can change she can change their grades if she wants to. She's a, the nightmare person that people might have a fantasy about a really malevolent person in authority who could ruin your whole life. Like some of the young, the high school students are her enemies, she thinks, because she's found out on, on social media that they say things about her. So she ruins their career. She can't, they can't get into the colleges they had wanted to get into. She's doing all these sabotage things, but nobody knows. The only person who knows is the, is the reader. But at the end, she does, um, she has a change of heart. <laughs> which, which also felt organic and real because it wasn't, you know, some huge change of heart, right? It felt like this small it's little nudge so that was realistic. So I, I love that. She's um, supposed to... And she's so self-destructive. She's sort of pulling her hair, her hair out. There's a disturbance that um, compulsive uh, disturbance of pulling her hair out. She's sort of hurting herself. So eventually, she has a kind of breakdown. No, I think she'll that's... never really be a good person, but she's going to try to to deal with life a little better. Yes, and you know the other thing that was like the Trump administration is that she's her behavior is bringing the whole school down. You know, she, she's stopping her own students from getting into good colleges, and, right? So everything's kind of going downhill. Um, I, what I, I, I love this, the way that she and her older sister, I felt that they were like uh, the equivalent of the evil stepsisters in a fairy tale in a way. And yet, further on in the book we they 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 go from being grotesques to humanized characters because then you spend time with them and it's such a pleasure uh this really is one of the pleasures of, of the book meanwhile the youngest siblings sophia and virgil um really we we meet them earlier and get to know them earlier on and see them um, in all their complexity and 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 they're really quite tender um, I wanted to talk about Virgil. He's really important. He's the black sheep of the family, um, primarily because he's an artist. And um, art and artists are, of course, so important to this book. I wondered if you could talk about Virgil and also about an art and its role in the book. Well, Virgil is, is an artist, but he's also somebody who's just not interested in following his father. He doesn't want to be a businessman. He doesn't want to be a middle class or upper middle class person. He doesn't want to get married. He doesn't want to have children. He basically just sort of opted out of all the things that meant a lot to, to Whitey and to, to his mother. He just doesn't want to do any of those things. And I think the whole family feels um, almost that he's judging them. He, there's a kind of moral superiority to Virgil that's annoying. You know, in a family, somebody like Virgil would be annoying. But of course, the real key to his personality is that he is he's gay, and he's never allowed himself to think that. And because his father would be absolutely horrified, Whitey would just have been totally shocked and overwhelmed by that. So as long as his father's alive, he can't, Virgil can't acknowledge his deepest desire. But then when his father dies, he starts to really reconstruct his whole personality, I think. He hadn't anticipated that his father would leave him a fair amount of money. His father leaves him as much money as he leaves the other children. And Virgil is so shocked because he thought certainly his father would leave him nothing. So he had to rethink his father. And I felt as the, as the novelist that it would be understood the father loves all the children equally, but he's exasperated with some of the children. He's very exasperated, which is normal for parents to be exasperated by some children, but that doesn't mean that they don't love them. Whereas the child himself might feel 
this, uh, this annoyance and exasperation and disapproval, he might feel that he's not loved, but that's not really true. So sometimes after somebody passes away, we suddenly realized, well, probably they did love us. And, and we didn't even, somehow we didn't realize it. And it's such, a, it's such an overwhelming sensation to realize that you missed, you missed something because maybe you thought your father didn't love you or your mother didn't love you, but really it was because they were disapproving or they, were, they wanted more or, or something. They were disappointed, but the, but the love was there. But then it's gone because it's too late. So Virgil has to sort of deal with that. Yes. And meanwhile, it's not for lack of love. It's simply there's a certain bafflement from his siblings, as well as his parents, just in, towards his artwork <laughs> and the fact that he doesn't make money from it, um, which, or he does make some money from it, I'll say. But um, I, I felt that there, this was very realistic, just the way that, you know, artists versus people who have nine to five jobs and a regular income, um, there's, people do look askance and it's, it's hard. Yes, and then some people got married right out of college when they were quite young, and they had children and established households and families. And those people feel that they've done the right thing. Because society just is so thrilled when you're pregnant, you're going to have a baby, and, and you know, got all this congratulations and a baby shower and presents. And society sort of really rewards that. And so later on in your life, you sudden you might realize, you know, overhearing your teenage children say pitying things about you, that may, maybe you actually did the wrong thing. May, maybe nobody really admires you at all. Because Beverly is someone who is dealing with children who are passing judgment on her. And we can just see that her teenage children are judging her in a way that she actually knows is probably accurate. She's got a husband who's bored with her and she's sort of bored with her marriage. So naturally she's very jealous of her younger brother, Virgil, because he hasn't done any, any of those things. So many people who are disapproving of others, they see them living the life that they wish that they had lived. You know, this reminds me of something that I thought of as I was reading this, which is the fact that you taught a course last year on the American dream. Yes. yes. You know, and I, I kept thinking how outwardly the McLarens seem to represent the American dream. Whitey McLarens owns his own business. They live in this big house that's a historic landmark. And Jessalyn is a homemaker. She has five children. Uh, and yet there's a sense that maybe there's something else going on here. Um, how were you thinking about the American dream or maybe just suburbia and perhaps even what you taught in your class um, well, when I put you the, sculpted this world? When I planned the, the course, it was much after writing this novel. So the, the course is really generated by a wish to look at documents like the Declaration of Independence and the Gettysburg Address and Walt Whitman and other you know, sort of major documents of our, of our America, and then go through the centuries and moving from Washington Irving up to present day writings by immigrant Americans who had been born in, in other countries and have become naturalized citizens. So sort of taking the whole American dream in, in a number of ways. So it became very broad. And I, at one point we were looking at white supremacy as exemplified in stories about Faulkner and Flannery O'Connor and some others. So it became, it became a course that was holding a mirror up to America as it was right at the time, because there's been a lot about white supremacy and the Trump supporters and racism and Black Lives Matter. And when I began the course, some of those things had, didn't exist yet. So it was like I was holding a mirror up to our 
our turmoil of America. And then right in the middle, the pandemic hit. And so all the students went home and we continued the, the course on, on Zoom. So I think it was a, a traumatic time for that generation. It still is. And that is the generation of our college students who will be most impacted by it, I think, psychologically. And their writing will be, so will confront this. There was a generation for whom the Great Depression was very important, a generation for whom World War II was very crucial, and the Vietnam War generation, and maybe the generation around 9-11. But now the younger people who are between the ages of, say, 17 and 25 or so, that group, the uh, pandemic and shutting our society down and being forced to go into quarantine and sort of delaying their mingling with one another and their, their age group, I think that's going to make an enormous uh, um, impression on their, their entire lives. So there should be some very interesting literature and art coming out of that, I think. I mean, I'm teaching creative writing and I know Daphne, you are also. So we'll probably be starting to see some of this reflected in, in the art. Definitely, definitely. Um, I see that we have some questions coming in. So what I'd like to do, I'm going to ask Joyce one more question that I have for her and then let's move on to your questions. And um, again, if any more from um, you out there, please type them into the Q&A. Uh, my question that I wanted to ask uh, is, there is a slight uh, uncanny element in here in that we, here, uh, Whitey persists even after his death. Uh, he's still around, and uh, and yet this is not a ghost story. It's a, a realistic novel, and yet you do write no ghost stories um, as well as horror stories, and um, in many other genres. And my question for you is: Do you know immediately when you have an idea for a story which genre you'll be writing in? Well, Daphne, I really do because I think my personality, and maybe, maybe you're similar because I think we have a kindred interest in, in different genres. I think that we have personalities that really are attracted to the, to the daylight and to the world of reality. And there's a, certain po there's a certain poetry in realism. Just holding the mirror up, as Stendhal said, the novel holds the mirror up to society. But then we spend, as we know, like one third of our lives asleep. So that means that we have one third of our lives is really eclipsed in, in the unconscious, we're dreaming. And so about approximately one half of my writing is actually gothic and surreal, exploring the unconscious, that world sort of subterranean world, almost um, a world of shadows rather than clearly delineated objects. But then when I, I sort of move away from that and I want to go back to the world of reality. So most of my, most of my novels are, are realistic novels, except for a sequence of Gothic novels that I wrote very deliberately. Uh, many of my short stories are Gothic and surreal because I'm so interested in that, uh, that dimension. But a novel like this is a realistic novel and there's nothing in it that's not realistic. I think we can recognize that the widow has been traumatized and she's, she's so connected with her deceased husband, there is no way she can detach herself from him. She sleeps in their bed. She's trying to read the books he was reading. She looks in his clothes closet. She's basically living the life, a posthumous life in the house where he would have been. So you can actually have a kind of conversation with a deceased person in a sort of a meditative way. You put a question to that person and you listen and you will probably get a pretty much an approximation of what that person might have said to you. Now you're not really hearing a ghost speaking, you're hearing something that's been internalized in your memory. So we all do this, it's called mourning. I think, and we spend a long time just sort of sitting as if you've been struck over the head by a, by a hammer, you're kind of 
stunned and dazed having lost someone in your life. But then as time goes on in that state, you sort of feel that person is still with you. I know that I, I certainly feel my mother is with me in, in some way, and my father is with me, and my former husband who, who passed away, who's sort of like the characters in the two characters, there are two husbands in, in the novel. And so I'm really writing a lot about personal experience. But in this particular novel, everything is realistic and nothing that happens is not realistic. Thank you so much for that. And I believe that uh, David's going to take over now and read out some of these questions for us for you to answer. There's some good David. questions here. The first one I wanna read you, Joyce, is about parenthood. And this is someone who's asking, one wants to think that a long married couple like Whitey and Jessalyn would raise their children who could and do love the way they do. What are your thoughts about this? Well, that's such an interesting question. I think you're quite correct. I think if we model ourselves after what's best in others, that this is very, very healthy and very positive. However, the problem is that in the world, if we never, if we come from a family that's very happy and we see our parents deeply in love and basically a very, very strong marriage, we may not find in the world anything remotely like that. I do know a couple of people who had very strong ties to their parents. They were very happy. Now, when those people grow up and go out into the world, they expect unconsciously, I think, from a spouse or a lover, the same sort of 100% um, devotion to them that they got from the parents. Now, you're probably not going to find that in the world. So it's a quixotic situation where for some of the children of the McLarens, they were so happy as children, they keep wanting to go back and live in that house even though they're now they're, you know, they're in their thirties, they can't really, you can't really go back to live with your mother. But yet there's a strong predilection. I know that there have been times in my life where I have this sort of yearning, oh, why can't I just go back and live with my mother, you know? And I realize, well, you know, I, I'm over 50 years old or I'm over 60 years old. Like my mother has been deceased, you know? It's one of these, almost mythical situations where the fairy tale past is so was so wonderful and then with nostalgia we make it seem even more wonderful so it's it's hard to be an adult and live live with a person who has many flaws and failings who doesn't love us with that total commitment that our parents might have loved us very interesting Here's a question um, also about Night, Death, Sleep, the Stars. Uh, this is from Eve Rosenthal. She says, writing a novel can be a very transformative experience. So what did you discover about yourself and or the world during the writing process of the novel? I have lots of experiences when I'm, when I'm writing. And one of them is, well, like Hemingway. Hemingway felt that you put what's best of yourself in your writing. And certainly for Hemingway and Faulkner also, that was so true. Those, those male writers, they were alcoholics, they had difficult relations with women. They put what was very, very best of themselves into their writing and you don't, you don't find much of it in the biography. So oddly enough, when you, read, when you read a work of fiction or a memoir that leaves you feeling uplifted and exhilarated, you, you should really understand that the writer put what's best of herself into it. Now the writer herself may not be equal to that. Art may not be cathartic. Art may be, art may be almost destructive to the person who creates it. I always felt that though my memoir about being a widow was, has been evidently uplifting to other people and helpful, that though I wrote it, I was not as strong as I thought I could be. I have always been surprised at my own failures and weakness. Now, if I work all morning on a, on a page of prose, if I really work all morning, 
there will be something there that will that's probably fairly strong and, and permanent you know I'm, I will feel it's all right but I can't do that without working hard so there's a feeling that one is sort of trading one's emotional life for something that is a little more permanent and we have to have faith that that's a worthwhile transaction so one of the things I wrote about in a widow's story I think early on in the memoir is how stunned I was at at how weak how weak I was. I was sort of like, or maybe I still am, sort of like a balloon that was just flattened. And I would have thought, looking ahead into the future, I would have thought that maybe I could have been stronger, but when it actually came to the test, it was like I was just blown down. So I have um, a great sympathy for people's weakness. And I learned in writing a memoir some years ago, I think it was 2008, I wrote the memoir. I learned a great uh, tolerance for people's weakness. Like I would never judge people who self-medicate, you know, people who are so unhappy that they're taking drugs or they're even they're smoking or they're drinking. I think the idea of self-medicating is something that we don't understand until we get into that position. And then we, then we almost wonder why, why everybody isn't self-medicating. You can feel so suicidal that you think that the suicidal impulse must be universal. And you kind of wonder why more people don't commit suicide because there's so much despair in the world. These are not states of mind that you stay in necessarily, but you may write about it. And then you sort of come out on, you may come out on another side, you know, in a few weeks. And so people then will read what you've written in a few weeks rather than the low point. But to be absolutely honest, I think in writing a journal, it's a good idea to have a journal where you write everything and never change it. Interesting. This is a similar question, but really kind of also related to, to this novel. And that is, you know, I can imagine that you had some big ideas about Jessalyn and what she was dealing with and widowhood and the family and the struggle. Um, and certainly maybe the, um, the position of the various children in the family, but w was there a character or a moment in the novel that surprised you when it happened? Or did you really in your head sort of map out the, the main points of the plot and kind of who these, these, these children are? Well, a novel sort of lives in its scene. So you have an idea and then, then a scene sort of becomes alive. Yes, when Jessalyn first meets Hugo, and when Hugo and Jessalyn are together having a little dinner, she is so overwhelmed by him, and she can't think straight, and she doesn't put the napkins out, and she doesn't really want him to be there. He's taking all the oxygen out of the, out of the room, and she, she'd rather be alone with her deceased husband, and she'd rather be alone with her sorrow. He sort of bursts in on her, and he's so um, sort of overbearing and, and pushy and aggressive. She's, she's like a compass whose, whose needles are spinning around. I was trying, I was sort of replicating experiences I've had in my own life where I set off with a certain determination and think that I know what, what's up. And then someone comes into my life and it's totally not what I expected. And there's no way that I can really deal with it. I've had that experience a couple of times in my life. And I try to put that in, in the novel. I think D.H. Lawrence is, does things like that also. You, you don't see that so much in, in more classical writers like Tolstoy or Jane Austen or maybe George Eliot. It's more writers who are trying to be faithful to the the spinning, the spinning and vertiginous nature of being a human being, where you almost don't know what you think. Well, are, are you in love with this person or you're just really, you don't want to see this person, no, you don't want to see this person ever again. Or maybe, maybe you do, you don't want to see the person again, but then you hear the person's voice and everything changes. So how can we be so weak though we feel we may be so strong. So I wanted to be faithful to that and not have characters who are really very 
strongly delineated, they're always open to some sort of incursion from the outside. Mm -hmm. Here's a question about your short story, The Little Wife, um, in your collection, Raven's Wing. The shocking, almost relentless nature of the story had a profound effect on me as a writer, as has your entire oeuvre. If I may ask two questions, what was the genesis of the story? And to what extent is the young runaway at the heart of the story complicit in the depravity of those around her? Well, that was a story that I probably wrote at a time when I was quite fascinated by um, elements in our society that were destructive. I, um, I was thinking of the deterioration of sort of a standard of, a standard of behavior that you can have a relatively stable family life, but then there are incursions from the outside that could be the pressure of your peers, like high school kids who, who don't really want to take drugs necessarily, but they take them because their friends are, are doing it. So I was writing about a personality that wasn't really strong and that took on the coloration of, you could call it dep depravity of behavior around her. I'm still interested in the masochism the predilection of masochism in women, which I think is stronger than in, in men. I don't want to sound sexist or I don't want to unleash a whole lot of angry people, but it is well known that a serial killer like Ted Bundy or even Jeffrey Dahmer, very, very depraved, horrible people, nonetheless, women write to them. Ted Bundy had many, many women writing to him and women who, who attended his, his trials. And a woman did marry him. I think she was a nurse. Uh, <clears throat> female murderers and horrible females <laughs> don't have the same sort of course. <laughs> they don't get the same sort of correspondence from men. It's a sort of strange, it's a peculiarity of women that they're drawn to strong almost like Nazi types. In fact, Sylvia Plath has, has a poem about this, you know. You're drawn to the boot, the, the boot in the face, you know, the women, is the, some women. Not all women, I like to think that I'm not one of them, obviously, and Daphne isn't either. I think writers are not likely to be that way. But um, the character in my story, the little wife is obviously one of these. Mm -hmm. Here's another question um, from someone who's in the middle of the book. She says, um, I'm on page 233 of the book and loving it as I've loved others of your books. Do you have a favorite among them of your novels? You're so prolific. What is your writing practice? Thank you so much. That's about three questions. <laughs> well, this, this, is very, this is very close to my heart. I have it right in my, my bedroom here. And if you read the novel, I'm in the bedroom. That's, that's Jessalyn's bedroom because I'm in the house that was the house in the novel, but it's not a landmark house. It's, it's the same house and it's on a creek and there's a lake, there's a canoe. And where Jesslyn goes down to the creek, that's down in my creek. And I even, even a cat, a cat, a feral black cat, a little like Mac the Knife Kitty, Mac, Mackie, the, Mackie the Cat, a cat like that even came here. So all these things kind of swirl together. So this is probably very close to my heart. But my novel Blonde is very close also, I think because I struggled so to write it. And so eventually identified with the doomed Marilyn Monroe. Uh, my novel Blonde is basically about Norma Jean Baker, who becomes Marilyn Monroe. So these two long novels are very close to my heart. This is a question about, Joyce, blonde, about blonde, actually. Go ahead, Daphne, you were gonna say something? I wanted to add something that Joyce didn't say, which was that the cat that came into your house came after you wrote Mackie into your book. Yes, so, yes, anybody, anybody who wants to follow me on Twitter can see pictures of Sheba. It was miraculous. Like one day I looked out and way at the edge of the woods was this black, figure coming and it was he came out of the woods and he crossed through the snowy field and he came right to the back of the house we have a cat door eventually he came into the house 
This was months after I wrote about a cat in the novel who did something like that. And it was as if this was a real life following this, this fictitious cat. I love it. Yeah. Someone wants to ask about Blonde um, and adaptions for film or, film or TV. Do you have any updates on that? Well, a wonderful director and, and writer, Andrew Dominic, has adapted Blonde for, for film. I've seen a rough cut of the movie. It's excellent. It's, um, it's the director's perspective of the novel. So some things are left out and some things are enhanced. And the, the woman who plays Norma Jean Baker or Marilyn Monroe is a Cuban-born actress. And I'm probably not going to pronounce her name correctly, but it's spelled A-N-A-D-E-A-R-M-A-S. She is absolutely brilliant. She doesn't seem like she's Cuban-American. She seems like Marilyn Monroe. She's, her hair, of course, is blonde, and she has been made up to look like Marilyn. The more the, mo the more the movie goes on, the more she looks like the iconic Marilyn. In the beginning, she looks like her face is almost unformed. She's very young. And as the movie goes on in a kind of terrifying way, she's more morphing into that iconic, uh, the Andy Warhol almost brand image of Marilyn Monroe, which is sort of like a, a, vulgar, a vulgar, uh, manifestation of the beautiful young woman. Hmm. Here's a question um, about a general question about teaching and about syllabus stuff. It says, um, I would love to see the syllabus for your American dream class. I would too, actually, but it's not, it's not a question. So their question is, it seems that the American dream survives even now. Why do you think that is? Or do you think people are starting to wake up? You know, it really depends on your perspective. In my class at Princeton, it was a freshman class, I had 15 students, um, many of them not, not Caucasian. They came from different backgrounds. And for some of them, very sincerely, the American dream was something that their parents and grandparents had believed in. That's why they came to the United States. They're pursuing the American dream, say, from China. But then the, the um, younger generation living here are, are part American and part, you know, their parents' uh, ethnic identity. So they're kind of between the two cultures. They respect the culture that they came from, but they are American born. And so they have to deal with this culture. They would be more likely to see the American dream as something of a, uh, an irony whereas their parents and grandparents saw it more, more as a shimmering mirage of a possibility, they see it in terms of American ra racial inequality right now in America. So they see the American dream a little less romantically than other people do. So I would say the American dream is almost entirely a matter of your perspective. If your family of George Floyd in Minneapolis you think of the American dream as a cruel joke. If you're, you've been born of a you know, multi-millionaire family and you, you've had your way, very, very easy way, and you've inherited a lot of wealth and you know, so forth, you would see the American dream as something that you inherited and you would think it was real. So again, I, I don't wanna say that there's no American dream, but it's, it's very much a subjective matter. And I think one of the things happening this summer is everyone realizing that just because they may, the dream may be alive for them, it's not for their neighbor. And that's a, that can be a disturbing realization. You want to believe it's there for other people, but you know, it's certainly not. Um, yes, and and I, how do we I think that's one of the good, the good uh, qualities of social media that we are much more open to an egalitarian vision of America, fragment into many regions and states and cities and, and, and areas so that we get almost a, gro a ground's eye view of what's going on in Portland or Minneapolis. Somebody's there with a cell phone who's recording what's really happening. Now, decades ago, we, we didn't see that. We only saw what the news outlets showed us. And before that, I mean, a long time before that, we just had like three television networks, you know, a long time ago. 
And before that, there was no television or just newspapers and magazines. And those were very completely white establishment um, centers for disseminating news. So if there are lynchings in the American South, people didn't know about it. They were just kept secret. But now, nothing, nothing's kept secret. So that's very positive. Indeed. I think we just have time for one more question. Um, but this is a general question about process. This um, question says, what is your writing process? When do you write? How much each day? Do you plot it out? Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. I, I like to start with daydreaming and I like to run. I do a lot of running and when we're done with our conversation, I might go running or bicycling. So I like to be in motion. I go up a hill, I go along a country road and I'm just sort of thinking about what I'm gonna be writing. So the scene that I'm gonna write when I get home starts to play out as a sort of visual drama without any, any narrative. So I don't have a prose narrative because I'm seeing it in my mind. And say, so if I can do that, I get a lot of ideas and I'm very excited. So I come back home and I might take some notes in longhand and I write very quickly. Then I might go to the computer, to the laptop and start writing in a more formal way. I do so much revision that by the time anything of mine is published, it's just gone so, so many layers and so many different, uh, it's just so many, like the, the first, page or the last page of a novel, I write, I write over and over and over again. And then I go through the whole novel and almost write every, I can write every sentence over again. So the writing is very much fluent and fluid until it's finally ended. It's always in some sort of changeable state, like the impressionable, the nature of our minds is always kind of changing. Very interesting. Daphne, did you want to say anything um, before we go? Oh my goodness. I think just thank you so much. This has just been an absolutely wonderful and revelatory conversation. And uh, I, I can't thank you enough, Joyce, for being here and for sharing your thoughts with us. And David, thank you very thank much you. for uh, mon monitoring everything. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Muck. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Thank you so much, Joyce and Daphne, for, for sharing yourselves um, with us this afternoon and talking about this. I could talk about this for another hour, but, um, but, I, but I know we've got to go. Um, there's one thing I'd like to say about the SpencertownAcademy.org website, our online virtual store. We've had a little glitch on one of those shopping buttons. But if you want to use the button that's underneath Thursday, September 3, that's the button that'll get you to the store. Um, and again, that if you want to go directly to it, it's Spencertown Academy, F-O-B, F as in Frank, O-B, festivalofbooks.org to get directly to that shopping site. So thank oh, you again and so much. Speaking Speaking of books, I do have one more thing that I want to say, which is that Joyce has another novel. It's not a novel. It's four novellas coming out, uh, a new book coming out next month. I'll leave you with that. It's called Cardiff by the Sea, and it will be out on October 6th, so a month from today. It's uh, four novellas of suspense. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you both so much. Have a great day. And all of you who joined us today, thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Happy fall. Bye. Bye-bye.